Hi, welcome back to Educator.com. Today we're going to talk about geometric sequences and series. The other specific kind of sequence we'll look at in this course is the geometric sequence, a sequence where we multiply by a constant number for each step. So in the previous lesson, we looked at the arithmetic sequence, which is where you add by a constant number. Now we're looking at geometric, where you multiply by a constant number every step. Just like arithmetic sequences, geometric sequences commonly appear in real life. Since geometric sequences are based on ratios, since we're always multiplying by the same thing, and ratios occur a lot in the world, they give us a way to describe a wide variety of things. In this lesson, we'll begin by going over what a geometric sequence is and how we can talk about them in general. Then we'll look into formulas for geometric series to make adding up a bunch of terms really easy and fast. Let's go! Start off with the definition. A sequence is geometric if every term in the sequence can be given by multiplying the previous term by some constant number r. So a n is equal to a n is equal to r times a n minus 1. That is, some term is equal to the previous term multiplied by r. So some term is equal to the previous term multiplied by r. We call r the common ratio because we can express it as a n divided by a n minus 1. That is some term divided by the previous term. And so we've got a ratio in the way we're building it. Here are two examples of geometric sequences. 3, 6, 12, 24, continuing on, 4 fifths, negative 4 over 25, 4 over 125, negative 4 over 625, continuing on. They're geometric because each step multiplies by the same number. For example, in this one, and every step we go forward, we're multiplying by 2. 3 to 6 times 2. 6 to 12 times 2. 12 to 24 times 2. And this is going to continue on forever as long as we keep going with that sequence. Over here, 4 fifths to negative 4 over 25. It's not quite as simple, but it's basically the same thing. Multiplying by negative 1 over 5. That's how we get from 4 fifths to negative 4 over 25 if we're going to multiply. To get to 4 over 125, once again, we multiply by negative 1 over 5. To get from 4 over 125 to negative 4 over 625, we multiply by negative 1 over 5. And this is going to keep going every time we keep stepping. So every step is multiplying by the same number. We're multiplying by the same number each step. The number can be anything. It can be positive. It can be larger than 1. It can be less than 1. It can be negative. It doesn't matter so long as it's always the same value for every step. The definition of a geometric sequence is based on the recursive relation a n equals r times a n minus 1. That is, every term is equal to the previous term multiplied by r. So how can we turn this into a formula for the general term, where we don't have to know what the previous term is, we can just want to know, I want to know the nth term, plug it into a formula, and out will come the nth term. Remember, a recursive relation needs an initial term. So while this relation that defines a geometric sequence, that's useful, but we still need a little bit more. We need this initial term to know where do we start, what is our very first term, because previous to that, there's nothing previous, so we just have to state that as one specific term. Since we don't know its value yet, we'll just leave it as a1, our first term. From a n equals r times a n minus 1, we see a1 relates to later terms as a2 will be equal to r times a1, right? The second term will be equal to the first term times r. This will continue on. The third term, a3, will be equal to r times a2. But we just showed that a2 is equal to r times a1, so we can plug that in for there and we'll have r times r times a1, so we wind up getting r squared times a1 is equal to a3. We can continue on here. a4 is going to be equal to r times a3, but hey, we just figured out that a3 is equal to r squared times a1, so we replace a3 and we wind up having r times r squared times a1, so now we have that r cubed times a1 is equal to a4. And we'll see that this pattern would just keep going like this. So we've got that a1 is equal to a1. No big surprise there. a2 is equal to r times a1. a3 is equal to r to the 2 times a1. a4 is equal to r to the 3 times a1. And we see that this pattern is just going to keep going like this. So the nth term, the nth term is n minus 1 steps away from a1, right? It's n minus 1 steps to get from a1 to n, right? If you start on the first stepping stone and you go to the nth stepping stone, you have to take n minus 1 steps forward. So we start at a1 to get to the a n, we have to go n minus 1 steps forward. Since every step means multiply by r, that means we've multiplied by r n minus 1 times, which is r raised to the n minus 1 power. 
Thus, we have that a n equals r to the n minus 1 times a 1. So to find the formula for the general term of a geometric sequence, we only need to figure out what the first term is and the common ratio. As soon as we figure out a 1 and our value for r, we figured out what the general term is, what the a n term is. Pretty great. What if we want to find the nth partial sum of a geometric sequence? That is adding up the first n terms of the sequence. So a1 plus a2 plus a3 up until plus a n. Well, we could just add it all up by hand for small values of n, right? If it was n equals 2, so it's just a1 and then a2, it's probably not that hard to just figure it out by hand. If it was n equals 3, we could probably do it by hand. But if it was n equals 10, n equals 100, n equals 1,000, this gets really, really tiresome really quickly as the value of n gets larger and larger. So how can we create a formula? How can we just have some formula where we can plug some stuff in and boom, we'll immediately know what is that nth partial sum? Well, let's do two things. First, let's give the sum a name. So I'll call our nth partial sum s sub n. So the sum for the nth partial sum. Second, let's use the form for the nth term of a geometric sequence. Remember, we just figured out the general form for a n is r to the n minus 1 times a 1. To put all the terms in this, so we can use this general term to put all of the terms in this series into a format that will involve a1, right? So we've got Sn is equal to a1 plus a2, which is r times a1, plus a3, which is now r squared times a1, up until we get to plus a, a n, which is now r raised to the n minus 1 times a1. Great. But at the moment, we can't do anything with just this. This isn't quite enough information. We can't combine the various r's. We can't combine the various r's because they all have different exponents, right? r to the 0, what's effectively here, r to the 1, r squared, r cubed, up until r to the n minus 1, they don't talk the same language because they don't have the same exponent. So since they can't really communicate with each other, we can't like pull them out all at once. We could pull out all the a1s, but then we'd still be left with all these different kinds of r's. So we don't really have a good thing that we can do right now, right? So what we want, what we're really looking for is a way to somehow get rid of having so many things to add up. We want fewer things to add up, right? If we only had a few things to add up and compute, it would be easy for us to calculate these values. So that's what we want to figure out how to do. So this is the really clever part. This is basically the part of the magic trick where suddenly we pull the, ha the rabbit out of the hat. And so at first you might see this and you're like, how would I figure this out? And it is a little bit confusing at first, but just like as you study magic more and more, if you were to study magic, you would eventually realize, oh, that's how they got the rabbit into the hat, or this is how the trick works. As you work with math more and more, you'll be able to see, oh, that's how we can make these sorts of things. So don't be a little bit, don't be worried by the fact that you wouldn't be able to think of this offhand. The people who made this proof in the first place, they didn't think of it immediately. They thought about it for a while, they figured out different things, and you know, maybe they tried something that didn't work, and eventually they stumbled on something, oh, if I do this, it works, and they're able to come up with this really easy, cool, clever way to do it. But it's not something that you just have immediately. It's something you have to think about until eventually you can pull your own rabbit out of a hat. But first you have to get the rabbit into the hat. Anyway, so here's the clever part. What is it? We've got Sn is equal to A1 plus R times A1 plus R squared times A1 plus blah, 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 plus R to the N minus 1 times A1. So the really cool trick that we do is we say, hey, what if we multiplied R times Sn? Well, that would wind up distributing to everything in here, right? since we're multiplying it on both sides of the equation. So we'd have r times a1 plus r squared times a1 plus r cubed times a1, blah, 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 all the way until we get up to plus r to the n times a1. Now notice, we've now got matching stuff going on, right? Here's r times a1, here's r times a1. There's a connection here. Here's r squared times a1, here's r squared times a1. There's a connection there. Here's r cubed times a1, and somewhere in, you know, in the next spot in the decimals is r cubed times a1 as well. Here's r to the n minus 1 times a1, and the next back spawn the decimals, here's r to the n minus 1 times a1. So we've got all of this matching going on. Well, with this idea, since we've got all this matching, we can subtract this equation, the rsn equation, this one right here, from the sn equation by using elimination, right? From when we talked about systems of linear equation, if we have two equations, we can subtract them, we can add them together. So we're just using elimination to do this. So we have our sn equation here, 
and then we subtract by minus r times sn. So now we've got this matching pattern going on. r times a1 matches to minus r times a1. They cancel each other out. r squared times a1 matches to minus r squared times a1. They cancel each other out. Everything in the dots here cancels out with all the negatives in the dots here. We finally get to r to the n minus 1 times a1 in our top equation, which cancels out with minus r to the n minus 1 times a1 in our bottom equation. So the only things that wind up being left over are minus rn times a1 and positive a1 here. So we get sn minus r times sn is equal to a1 minus rn times a1. So through this immense cleverness, and once again, this isn't something that you'd be expected to just know off the bat and be able to figure out really easily. This is the part that takes the really long thinking. This is the really clever part. This is what takes hours of thought by just thinking, hmm, I wonder if there's a clever way to do this, and eventually you wind up stumbling on it. So through immense cleverness, we've shown that Sn minus R times Sn is equal to A1 minus R to the N times A1. Hey, pretty great. So we've got this from what we just figured out. Now, our original goal was to find the value of the nth partial sum, which was Sn. Using the above, we can now solve for Sn, right? We just pull out the Sn. So we pull out our Sn, so we've got Sn times 1 minus r. We can also pull out the a1 over here on the right side. We divide both sides by 1 minus r, and we get the nth partial sum is equal to the first term, a1, times the fraction 1 minus r to the n, over 1 minus r. So we've now got a formula to find the value of any finite geometric series at all, really easily. All we need to know is the first term, a1, the common ratio, r, which shows up on the top and the bottom, and how many terms are being added together total, the n exponent on our top ratio. Pretty great. Really, really powerful formula that lets us do a lot of what would be very tedious, very slow, difficult addition, just like that. But what if the series was not finite? So far, we've only talked about if we're doing a finite sum of a sequence. But what if we had an infinite sequence and we wanted to add up infinitely many of the terms? So we ad kept adding terms forever and ever and ever. So to understand this better, let's consider some geometric sequences and what happens as we take partial sums using more and more and more terms. First, we'll look at 3, 9, 27, 81, 243. So it's times 3 each time. It's a geometric sequence. So our first partial sum, S1, would be just the 3, 3. Our next partial sum would be S2, so we add on the 9 as well, we get 12. Our next partial sum would be S3, we add on the 27 as well, we get 39. Next partial sum, S4, we add on the 81, we get 120. Next partial sum, we add on 243, we get 363. And this is just going to keep going on this pattern, right? It's going to keep adding more and more and more. So we look at this we notice that as the partial sums use more and more terms, it continues to grow at this really fast rate. In fact, the rate is going to get faster and faster and faster as we add more and more terms, right? We see its rate of growth increasing as it goes to larger sums. So if we add terms to the series forever, it's not going to really get to anything. It's going to blow out to infinity. It's going to just blast off to infinity. There's no stopping this thing. It's not going to give us a single value. It never stops growing. We say such an infinite series, one that never stops growing, that doesn't go to a single value, we say it diverges. As we add more and more terms, it continues to change forever. It diverges from giving us a single nice clean value because it instead just blows off to infinity. It keeps moving around on us. It doesn't stay still. It doesn't go to something. It just goes off. So this would be a divergent series. On the other hand, we could consider another partial sum. So from this below geometric sequence. So 1, 1 half, 1 quarter, 1 eighth, 1 sixteenth. So what we're doing each time here is we're dividing by 2, multiplying by 1 half. So we see this is a geometric sequence. So our first sum, partial sum, would be S1 equals 1. We just add in that first term. Next one, S2, would be 1.5 because we add in 1 half. So we're at 1.5. Next one, S3, we add in a quarter. So that's 0 0.25 added in. That becomes 1.75. Next one, S4, we add in an that becomes 1.875. Next one, S5, we add in 1 16th, that becomes 1.9375. And it would continue in this way, but we notice it's not really growing the same. This time, the sums are continuing to grow, but the rate of growth is sort of slowing down with each step. It's not increasing out like the previous one. It was blowing out somewhere. It was becoming really, really big. But with this one, we see it sort of settling down, right? As we add more and more terms, it's going to a specific value. It's going to 2. The infinite sum, this infinite series, is going to a very specific value. It's working its way towards 2. If you keep adding more, you'll see even more as it gets to 1.9. 
1.999999999999. As you keep adding more and more terms, you'll see that it's really just working its way to a single value. It's slowing down as it gets to 2. In this case, we say such an infinite series converges. It's converging on a specific value. As we add more and more terms, it works its way towards a single value. There's this single value that it's working towards. So from the two examples we've seen, we see that whether a series converges or diverges is based on the common ratio of its underlying sequence. If the common ratio is large, so if we've got a common ratio that's large, it causes the sequence to always grow. It keeps growing because that ratio keeps multiplying it to get larger and larger and larger and moving around. So specifically, if the absolute value of r is greater than or equal to 1, the partial sums will always be changing because the size of our terms never shrinks down, so the series will diverge. On the other hand, if the common ratio is small, it causes the sequence to shrink down. So if we've got a small common ratio, it was going to make it smaller and smaller and smaller with every term we work on. So since it gets smaller and smaller and smaller, we have if the absolute value of r is less than 1, the rate of change for the series will slowly disappear to nothing. Because every time we go to the next term, since r is less than 1, it makes it smaller, and then it makes it smaller, and then it makes it smaller, and makes it smaller, and makes it smaller, and makes it smaller. So every time it's getting smaller, so every time the the rate of growth is going down to less and less and less. And so over the long term, over that infinite number of terms, it winds up converging to a single value. So as a general rule, an infinite geometric series will converge if and only if the absolute value of r is less than 1. So the absolute value of r is less than 1 means that the infinite, infinite geometric series converges. If the infinite geometric series converges, then the absolute value of r must be less than 1. They're equivalent things for a geometric sequence. All right. Assuming that the absolute value of r is less than 1 for a geometric sequence, how can we figure out a formula for its corresponding infinite geometric series? Well, we already figured out a formula that's true for any finite geometric series. Remember Sn, the nth partial sum of any finite geometric series is a1 times 1 minus r to the n over 1 minus r. We just figured out that formula. Pretty cool. Not only that, but we also know that as we look at partial sums containing more and more terms, so as the partial sums has more and more terms, they have to be growing closer and closer to the value that the infinite series will converge to. Right? As we put in more and more terms into our partial sum, it has to be getting closer to this value that it's going to converge to. Think about why that is. If the partial sums were not getting closer to a specific value, if they were moving around away from the specific value, then it couldn't be converging to that because it would always be changing around. If it's going to converge to a single value, it has to be working its way towards it. So if it's working its way towards it, it must always be getting close to the thing. If it wasn't always getting closer, if it was sometimes jumping away, it wouldn't be working its way towards it, it would be going somewhere else. So since we know it is working its way towards it, we know that it must be converging, so, sorry, since we know that it's converging, we know that it must be working its way as we have more and more terms in our partial sum. So as we put in more terms in our partial sum, we'll be closer to the value we're converging, right? As we add way more and more and more terms in our partial sum, we're going to have more, we're going to be closer to the thing that we're converging to. So what we're asking ourselves is, as we have really large values for n, what value are we getting close to? So what happens to the formula we figured out, our nth partial sum formula, Sn equals a1 times 1 minus r to the n over 1 minus r, as the number of terms we have, as our n goes off to infinity, as the value for the number of terms we have, our, as our n becomes infinitely large, what will happen to this formula? Whatever happens to this formula is what we have to be converging to because of the argument we just talked about, about how it has to be getting closer as we put in more and more terms. So notice the only term on the right side affected directly by the n is r to the n, right? There's no other term that directly has an n connected to it. So we can ask ourselves what happens to r to the n as our n grows very large. Also, remember, r is less than 1. The absolute value of r has to be less than 1. These two things combined as we ask ourselves as n goes to infinity and we're looking at r to the n, right, our r to the n here, since the absolute value of r is less than 1, we have that as n goes to infinity, r to the n has to go to 0. So it's going to shrink down to 0 as n grows infinitely large. So why is that the case? Well, since the absolute value of r is less than 1, every step has to make it smaller. For example, if we look at 0.9 raised to the 100, we get that that's less than 0 0.0001. Why is this occurring? Well, since the absolute value of r is less than 1, right? 
we know that it's this fractional thing that effectively every time we iterate it, every time we hit a term with this ratio, this common ratio, it takes a little bite out of it. Whether it's 0.1 or 1 half or 3 fifths or 922 1 thousandths, it's going to take a bite out of whatever the term it's being multiplied against is. As it takes infinitely many bytes, since it's always shrinking it down, it means that it's always working its way towards this value of zero. Infinitely many bytes away gets us to having nothing. Therefore, because Rn is going to zero as n goes to infinity, we have this part right here shrinks down to a zero in our formula. So we get the following formula for an infinite geometric series. The infinite sum is equal to a1 times 1 over 1 minus r, assuming that the absolute value of r is less than 1. If the absolute value of r is greater than or equal to 1, we couldn't even talk about this in the first place because our series would be diverging because it would always be growing and changing around on us. But if we have the absolute value of r is less than 1, all we need to know is our first term a1 and the rate that it's growing at, and we work it out through this formula and we know what it will converge to over the long run. All right, cool, ready for some examples. First one, show that the sequence below is geometric, then give a formula for the general term, that is the a n, the nth term. So we've got 7, 35, 175, 875. So what we want to ask ourselves is, what number are we multiplying by each time? So how do we get from 7 to 35? Well, we multiply by 5. Let's check and make sure that that works. 35 to 175, yep, if we use a calculator or do it in our heads or write it out by hand, we realize, yeah, we can multiply by 5 to get from there to there. Same thing, 175 to 875, we multiply by 5. So we see that this is continuing. Yes, it is geometric. That checks out. Now, we want to give a formula for the general term. We talked in the lesson about how a n is equal to a1, sorry, let me write it the way we had it last time. So r, the rate that we're increasing at, to the n minus 1 times a1. What is our a1? Well, a1 is equal to 7 because it's the first term. What is our r? r is equal to 5 since it's the number we're multiplying each time. So r equals 5. r equals 5, a1 equals 7. So a n is equal to 5 to the n minus 1 times 7. And if we wanted to check this out, so we could do like a real quick check. So we could plug in, let's look at a2, that would be equal to 5 to the 2 minus 1 times 7. So 5 to the 1 times 7, 5 times 7 is 35. We check that against what our second term was, and indeed that checks out. So looks like we've got our answer, there is our answer. All right, next example. Find the value of the finite geometric series below. So notice this does have an end. We stop at 3072, so it's not an infinite one. If it were infinite, it would blow out to infinity, so we wouldn't actually be able to find a value. All right, so how do we figure this out? First thing, what is the rate that we're increasing at? To get from 3 to 6, we multiply by 2. To get from 6 to 12, we multiply by 2. So at this point, we realize r equals 2. What is the value a1? That's 3. What we're looking for, remember, the formula that we're going to do, the nth partial sum, Sn is equal to a1 times 1 minus the rate raised to the nth power divided by 1 minus the rate. So the only thing we've got to figure out left is what is our n? n equals question mark. How many values are we going to be at? Right here we're at a1, but this is a question mark. This is a n right over here. So what would that have to be? Well, we could set this up using the formula that we talked about before, our general formula for the uh, general term. So a n is equal to r to the n minus 1 times a 1. So we plug in our a n, that is 3072. 3072 equals our rate is 2 raised to the n minus 1 times a 1 is 3. So we divide both sides by 3 because we're looking to figure out our n. Divide both sides by 3 and we get 1024 equals 2 to the n minus 1. Now, you might just know offhand, 1024 is the tenth power of 2. So 2 to the tenth equals 1024. So we would see that it is 10 steps to get forward. We've multiplied 10 steps forward. So that would mean our n is equal to 11. We figured out that to get 2 to the tenth, that's 10 steps. We multiplied all of them on the 3. We started at 3 as our first stepping stone. We stepped forward 10 times. So first stepping stone plus 10 steps forward means a total of 11 stepping stones. So we've got n equals 11. However, alternatively, we could just figure this out. This equation right here, we could figure out by using the work that we did with logarithms long ago in this class. So 1024 equals 2 to the n minus 1. Well, what we can do is we can just take log of both sides. Log 1 1024 equals the log 
of 2 to the n minus 1. One of the properties of logs is that we can pull down exponents. That's why this is so useful. So we've got n minus 1 times log of 2, log 1024 over the log of 2 equals n minus 1, 1024 over 2, sorry, log 1024 over log 2 is equal to 10 equals n minus 1, which tells us that n equals 11. So you could work this out, just throw raw algebra and using logarithms, or you could work it out if you recognize 2 to the 10th is equal to 1024, if you just kept dividing 1024 with a calculator until you saw how many steps it was. Either way, we'll wind up getting us to this value that n equals 11. All right. Great. So now we have everything that we need for our sum. So Sn, the nth partial sum, so in this case, the 11th partial sum of what this sequence would be, is going to be equal to a1 is 3, our first term, times 1 minus our rate. It multiplied by 2 on each one of them, raised to the 11th power, because the number of terms we have total is 11, divided by 1 minus the rate, 2 once again. We work this out, 3 times 1 minus 2 to the 11th is negative 2047, 1 minus 2 is negative 1, so the negative 1 cancels out with the negative on top, we've got positive 2047 times 3, and we wind up getting 6141 is what we get once we add up all of those terms. Great. Third example, find the value of the below sum. So the sum sigma sum, sigma notation from i equals 0 up until 10 of 500 times 1 half raised to the i minus 3 to the i divided by 64. So previously when we talked about sigma notation, series notation, we talked about how summations have properties where we can separate some of the things in sigma notation and we can pull out constants. Great. So let's start off by separating this. So we can write this as sigma it still has the same upper limit, the limits won't change, same index and lower limit of 500 times 1 half to the i minus, so what we're doing is we're separating around this subtraction, minus the series, same limits of 3 to the i over 64. So we can separate based on addition and subtraction into two separate series. Furthermore, we can also pull out constants and just multiply the whole thing. So we've got 500 times the series, 10 i equals 0, 1 half to the i, minus, we can pull out the 1 over 64, since that's just a constant as well. On the series, 10 i equals 0, 3 to the i. So at this point, we can now use our formulas. Remember, our formula was the nth sum is equal to the first term times 1 minus r to the n over 1 minus r. So each one of these are going to wind up having different rates, but they are going to wind up having the same n. Our n is going to be based off of going from 0, our starting index, all the way up to 10, our ending index. So what is our n if we go from 0 to 10? Remember, we have to count that first step. So 0 up until 10 isn't 10, it's 11. 1 to 10 is 10, so 0 to 10 must be one more 11. So we've got n equals 11. All right, back into this, we've got 500 times Let's use that formula, the series from i equals 0 to 10 of 1 half to the i. Well, what would it be for our a1? What would be the first term? Well, if we plugged in i equals 0 on 1 half to the i, 1 half to the 0, anything raised to the 0 is just 1. So our a1 is 1 there, times 1 minus what's the rate? Well, we're multiplying by 1 half each time because it's 1 half with an exponent on it. So 1 half is our rate, raised to the n, our n that we figured out was 11 divided by 1 minus the same rate, 1 half. Great. Minus over here, 1 over 64. We apply that formula again. So series from i equals 0 to 10 of 3 to the i. What is our a1? What is the first term? Well, 3 to the 0th, because our starting index is 0 once again. So the first term of this series would be 3 to the 0th, because it's the first thing that would show up. 3 to the 0th is 1 just again. 1 minus What's our rate? Our rate is 3 because we multiply by 3 successively for each iteration because it's an exponent. 3 to the, what's our number of terms? 11, n equals 11, 1 minus 3. Great. Now we can work through a calculator to figure out what these things, I will save the incredibly boring actually just doing the arithmetic, but it shouldn't be too difficult. So this would become 500 times 2047 over 1024 
minus 1 over 64 times 88,573. We can combine these things. So actually, let's uh, distribute our constants first. So 2047, well, distribute just the multiplication. They're all constant numbers now. So 255,000 on our left, uh, 875 divided by 256 minus 88,573 over 64. We have to put the right side on a common denominator, but once again, I'll spare working out every single aspect. This would simplify to negative 98,417 divided by 256, and there is our answer exactly precise. If we wanted to, we could have approximated to decimals at some point, and we'd get negative 384.44 approximately. So notice, probably back here when we were working at these steps where we've got these giant fractions, there's a good chance if you're working with a scientific calculator or graphing calculator that doesn't show it perfectly in fractions, you'd wind up getting fractional numbers. And for the most part, most teachers, most textbooks would be fine with giving an answer in decimals instead. So either one of these two answers, the specific exact fraction of negative 98,417 over 256 or approximately negative 384.44, both of them are perfectly fine. Fourth example, many lessons ago, when we first learned about exponential functions, we had a story where a clever mathematician asked for one grain of rice on the first square of a chessboard, then two on the second rice, then four on the third, uh, sorry, two on the second square, four on the third square, eight on the uh, fourth square, 16, 32, 64, 128. He keeps asking for doubling amounts of grains of rice. So if he had actually been paid on all the squares, so if he had been paid on all the squares, just as he was initially promised, how many grains of rice would he have total? So what we've got here is a finite series, a finite geometric series, because it's doubling each time. So what's our first term? Well, A1, it was on the very first square. He had one grain. So our first term is going to be one. What's the rate that it increases at each time? It goes one, two, four, eight, 16. So it's doubling each time. So that means the rate is multiplied by two. And what is the number of terms total? If we're going from the first square of a chessboard to a chessboard is eight by eight, right? So total squares, total squares on an eight by eight chessboard. We've got eight by eight. So that means we've got 64 squares total. So that's going to be 64 times this is going to have happen. We have 64 terms here, so 64. So if we're gonna figure this out, the nth partial sum, the 64th partial sum is going to be the first term, A1, times one minus the rate, two, raised to the number of terms, 64, over one minus the rate, two. We work this out, we wind up getting 1 minus 2 to the 64th over negative 1, which is the same thing as negative 1 minus 2 to the 64th, which we'll wind up seeing comes out to be very positive. So this is our precise answer for the number of grains, but let's see what that is approximately. That comes out to be approximately 1.845 times 10 to the 19th grains of rice. That is a whopping, incredibly huge number of grains of rice. It might be a little bit hard to see just how many grains of rice that is, 10 to the 19th. We're not used to working with scientific notation that large. So let's turn it into some words we might understand. That would be about the same as 18 quintillion. That is a quintillion. So it goes million, billion, trillion, quadrillion, quin trillion grains of rice. And we are once again not really used to working with numbers as incredibly large as the quintillion scale. So let's write that as 18 billion billion grains of rice. That is a whack, like incredible number of grains of rice. That is so many grains of rice. How much rice is that? That is about more than the rice that has ever been produced by humanity over all of humanity's time existing. It might be approximately on the same scale as the uh, amount of rice human humanity has ever created. I'm talking about 
all of humanity ever creating over the whole history of the world. All of the rice that has ever been made, 18 billion billion grains, that's probably somewhere on the scale. Might be a little bit more, might be a little bit less, but that's the sort of scale. All of the rice that humanity has ever created. We get to very, very large numbers very quickly with these exponential functions when we're working in geometric stuff, so that's something to keep in mind. 18 billion billion grains, as much rice as humanity has ever made. Pretty amazing. Final example, a super ball is dropped from a height of three meters. On every bounce, it bounces four-fifths of the previous height. If allowed to bounce forever, what is the total back and forth distance the ball travels over? Notice that's total, so it's up and down. So let's draw a picture to help ourselves see what's going on here. So we start off, we've got this ball, we drop the ball, and it falls three meters. Then it bounces, right? It's a super ball, so it bounces up, and it will go up by how much? It will go up by three times four-fifths, right? Because it goes up to four-fifths of its previous height on every bounce. Now it's going to fall down. Well, what height did it just fall down from? It's going to fall down from the same thing, three times four-fifths. Then it's going to bounce up again. It's going to bounce up by how much? Well, it's going to bounce up to three times four fifths times four fifths, because it's four fifths of the previous height it came from. Three times four fifths times four fifths. Well, we could just write that as three times four fifths squared. Then it's going to fall down once again from that same height, so three times four fifths squared. And then it's going to just continue on in this matter of going a little bit less each time. So three times four fifths cubed, and then down again, three times four fifths cubed, and just continuing on in this matter forever. So we want to figure out the total back and forth distance the ball travels over. So notice what we've got here is we've got ups and we've got downs. So I'm going to go with calculating the ups first. How much is from this up, plus this up, plus this up, going on forever and ever and ever and ever. So notice what that means we're dealing with is we're dealing with an infinite sum because we're saying if it were to bounce, continue bouncing forever, what would be the amount of distance it would travel over? So that is equal to the first value times 1 over 1 minus the rate. That was what we figured out the infinite sum comes out to be. So first value times 1 over 1 minus the rate. All right, so in this case, for our up jumps, our up bounces, the up bounces all the ups, so all ups, is going to wind up being our first value is a1, so our first value is this one right here, 3 times 4 fifths. We might be tempted to think it's 3 meters, but remember, this is all the ups. We're looking at the ups first, and we'll see why at the end, why I chose to look at the ups first. So all ups, that's going to be 3 times 4 fifths is our first value that we wind up having occur. And then that's going to be times 1 over 1 minus, what's the rate? 4 fifths, because it's 4 fifths on every bounce. It goes up to 4 fifths of its previous height. So the rate for the next one will be 4 fifths of that, then 4 fifths of that, then 4 fifths of that. Notice there was one, actually, there was one other requirement on being able to use this. The absolute value of our rate must be less than 1. But since it's 4 fifths, that winds up checking out. OK, keep going with this. So that's 3 times 4 fifths. Let's write it as 12 fifths. 12 fifths over, uh, sorry, 12 fifths times 1 over 1 minus 4 fifths is 1 fifth. Well, 1 divided by 1 fifth is 12 over 5 times 1 over 1 fifth is 5. So we've got 5 times 1 fifth on the bottom cancels out. So we've got 12 meters total of bouncing for our up values. So 12 meters total for our up values. OK, but that's only part of it. Now we also have to figure out what are all of the down values, right? What's the down value here, the down value here, the down value here, going out this way infinitely? Well, we've also got this part right here. But notice, all of these green things, they wind up having a matching up value, right? They each match up. The purple and the green, the purple ups and the green downs all match up. The only guy who's sort of out of the normal case of matching up is that red first drop down. So what that means is that we can match all of our downs has a matching 12 meters because it matches all of the ups, but then we just have to add on the initial 3 meter drop at the beginning. So how many downs do we have in total? Well, that 3 meter drop plus the match value, because it matches to the 12 meter value for all the ups, so 12 meters plus 3, we get 15 meters. So the total, the total number 
is going to be equal to the 15, sorry, the 12 from our ups plus the 15 from our downs. 12 plus 15 means 27 meters in total. Great. There we are. Finish that one. All right. So now we've got a pretty good understanding of how sequences work. We've worked through geometric sequences, arithmetic sequences. We understand how series work. We've got a pretty good idea of how sequences work. So great. All right. We'll see you at educator.com later. Bye.